Half Past Alligator by Donald Colvin. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Dale Grothman. It takes sportsmanship to make a ball team, and foul play to get a backward race civilized. Half Past Alligator by Donald Colvin. Bill Bradley shooed away the group of Quaxus that had surged over the first base line. With broad grins on their flat, piebald faces, they moved away, in the wrong direction, of course, and squatted in a smiling semicircle around Pat Reed, who was playing third. This was bad, because Reed was a 50-50 player. It was an even chance whether he got the ball, or the ball got him. One of the half-domesticated thrags broke loose and cantered across the outfield with its peculiar five-legged gait. In the hubbub, Ray Bush stole second. Nobody seemed to notice. Sighing heavily, Bill returned to the mound and whiplashed a fast one tight across the letters. The hitter got only a small piece of it. A pop fly sauntered toward left field. Judging it to a nicety, Gus Mustus came racing in, evading a tethered thrag, leapt a hole some Quaxa had dug and forgotten, and made a shoestring catch, retiring the side. The Quexas cheered deliriously. Bill trotted off the mound. For a moment, the thrill of the game held him. This was the way things should be. The feel of smoothly flowing muscles, the thudding sound of horsehide hitting a leather glove, the weight of a bat in your hands in your first ball game after clambering over and scrabbling in an unexplored planet for fourteen months. Then he caught sight of Candace Matthews, walking among the pneumo huts that served as the outpost camp for the expedition. Gloom enveloped him again, surrounding him like a dank fog. For fourteen long months Bill had feasted on the memory of Candy Matthews on his recollection of her turquoise eyes and cascading brown hair, on the remembrance of her soft lips on his last night under the four moons of Vincer III. Today she had arrived with the seventy-odd men and women who comprised the appraisal unit, the final group of the planet's explorers. He had looked forward like a schoolboy to her coming, and, like a schoolboy, he had suffered black despair when his dreams were shattered. For the Candy Matthews who got off the shuttle bug at Camp Outpost was not the Candy Matthews who had said soft words on Vincer Three. She was, instead, a self-assured young woman, somehow harder, who felt only an indifferent tolerance toward the tall young man named Bill Bradley, and the all-consuming, hero-worshipping infatuation for a newcomer, a dapper walking brain, Vance Montgomery, one of the Council's smart boys, with the title of Planet Evaluator. He's simply wonderful, she had said, and the joy of life had gone out of Bill Bradley. The appraisal group brought in athletic equipment, and Bill's men spontaneously declared a holiday, their first on the planet. Baseball was the order of the afternoon, and they shanghaied a not unwilling Bill to pitch. He should, he knew, be laying out reports for Montgomery to study, he did not particularly want to be with Montgomery. He sat on the Yextel log that served as a bench. One Quexa was bent over examining first base. He made a colorful sight. The first baseman slapped him jovially on the loincloth to move him. The owner of the thrag caught up to it and was struggling manfully to lead it away. The five-legged beast defied his efforts, rearing and dragging him. A dozen Quexas stood nearby. Their sympathies were obviously with their fellow Quexa, but they made no move to help him. Reed was on the bench next to Bill. He had come in with the appraisal group. Your vivid friends, he said, cocking a thumb at the Quexa, don't appear too bright. They're smart enough, said Bill, almost as intelligent as we are. It's just that they've never risen above a herd culture. Look, said Reed. I'm a silviculturalist. Give me a hunk of wood and I'll tell you how long it took to grow, what it's good for, where it can be raised, and how much board and profit can be made out of it. But this kind of talk throws me. Try another wavelength. 
Socially, they're like seals or penguins back on Earth. They like to gather in groups. The things they can do individually, they do well. But they don't know how to help each other. That's beyond them. Don't understand the meaning of cooperation? The word isn't even in their language. I've seen forty of them standing around, fretting and stewing, while the Horels killed off one of their fellows. What are Horels? The other dominant life form here. Nasty brutes, like big upright ants with tentacles, standing about as high as my chest. Most malignant thing I've ever seen. One Quexa can handle any Horel, maybe even two or three. But the Horels hunt in packs. Goodbye, Quexa. Killing them off, are they? This is the last big concentration the Quexas have left. In another hundred years, there'll be no more Quexas. They looked again at the natives. The Quexas were something to see, human in form, although somewhat shorter than Earthmen. Their skins were blotched and dashed with patches of vivid colors. Antiquarians talked of their resemblance to the ancient circus clowns, a likeness furthered by their broad, flat faces and habitual grins. Sorta of hate to see them disappear, Bill said glumly. They're happy, good-natured creatures. In their whole race I know only one who's mean. We've done our best to help them. But if they don't cooperate, even in a matter of life and death, what incentive can you offer them? An elbow dug into him. Up to the platter, dear boy, said Gus Must. A hit means two runs. Selecting a bat, Bill made his way to the plate. In the middle distance, Vance Montgomery emerged from a hut. Candy went to him eagerly, put a hand on his arm. A deep rage engulfed Bill. The first pitch was a curve that failed to break. As it came flatly over the plate, Bill swung angrily. The ball rocketed up and away, past the infield, over the head of the desperately running left fielder, and dropped toward a sure home run. Then a curious thing happened. One of the Quexas darted away from the gabbling group along the foul line, his short legs churning over the uneven ground. As the ball sank, he dove, plucked it out of the air with one broad hand, turning a somersault, and came up with it, grinning. It was an impossible catch, and the Earthmen joined the Quexas in applause. Still clinging to the ball, the Quexa made little bobbing bows of acknowledgment. "'Throw it in!' shouted Bill. The Quexa stood motionless. "'Throw it in, Adla!' he urged. He went through the throwing motion. The Quexa nodded comprehension. He went into a violent wind-up. His left foot came up, his upper body went back, his right arm snapped in an arc. The ball flew from his hand, straight and fast. In the wrong direction, of course. The pack of Quexas pelted after it, shouting, picked it up and threw it again. To his surprise, Bill found himself pounding after them, bawling fruitless pleas, aware that he looked foolish, but in his rage, not caring. He closed in on them on the fifth throw, and his fingertips touched the ball. He succeeded only in deflecting it. There was a dull thunk, and the game was over. The ball had struck Vince Montgomery, planted evaluator, squarely in the left eye. Three things were said then to Bill Bradley. One was by Montgomery, as he handed back the ball. I was not aware, Bradley, that the job of camp leader entailed joining the rowdyism of the native races. One was by Candy Matthews, hopping with anger. You're a barbarian, Bill Bradley. Monty might have been badly hurt. The third was by a clod of Quexas, crowding eagerly. Play ball, Bill Brad, more play ball. To the first two, Bill did not reply. To the Quexas, he said one word, nuts, and dolefully followed Montgomery into the headquarters hut. In spite of his natural prejudice against Montgomery, Bill was forced into a reluctant admiration for the way the man worked. Montgomery's task was to recommend whether the planet should be marked for immediate colonization, placed on a reserve list for future expansion, or to be left strictly alone, as unworthy of occupancy. He tore through Bill's reports like a small child 
through a bag of jelly beans. His questions, if pompous, were pointed. Within twenty-four hours, ready to leave for the main camp, he called a conference. He stood before the group, as dapper as a man can be with a rainbow bruise under one eye, complacently listening to the resonance of his own voice. Beside him, Candy nodded worshipful agreement. Bill grumped in a corner. For a full forty-five minutes, Montgomery outlined additional data he wanted gathered. His voice was faintly chiding, implying by its tone that anybody but a dolt would have obtained the information long ago. And now, he said, we come to the question of the humanoid denizens of this planet, the so-called Quaxus. He fingered his black eye. Many persons might conclude that the Quaxus are not worth saving, and in themselves they are not. However, my preliminary conclusion, based unfortunately on insufficient data, lead me to believe that this planet will be used for colonization in about five hundred years. It would be very convenient, then, to have the dominant life form friendly to the galactic humans and capable of being integrated with the colonists. Some method of preserving the Quaxus must therefore be worked out. In this, the advance group has failed lamentably. He paused, glanced around triumphantly. How do I propose to achieve this? By a historical method. What do nations do when they are in peril? They call upon a single man, place themselves under him, and let him lead them out. When the ancient Western civilization was in its greatest danger after the fall of Rome, the people gathered around the strong men, made them kings and dukes and earls, and were saved from barbarism. I shall do the same for the Quaxus. The Quaxus shall have a king. His eyes sought out Bill. My acquaintance here has been short. I must rely on advice. Bradley, whom would you recommend for king of the Quaxus? Well, said Bill slowly, Moalo is the most intelligent. He's good-natured and kindly. He has a lot of artistic ability. Some of his carvings are being taken back for the Galactic Folk Museum. An artist, said Montgomery in disgust. Well, let's have a look at him. Moalo was finishing a figurine near one of the meandering paths that the Quaxa had worn by habit, not design. A bemused group of natives looked on admiringly. Down the path came Retaka, the biggest of the Quaxas. His shoulders proudly back, his face set in a truculent scowl. Bill knew and disliked him and apprehensively felt sure that the peaceful scene would be destroyed. Alone, of an amiable, tolerant race, Rataka was perpetually ill-tempered, the rankling product of Lord knew what alien genetic accident or trauma. Rataka found his path obstructed by the carving. Callously, he brought his foot down on the delicate figurine, crushing it into splinters. Moalo sprang up in gentle protest. Rataka gave him the back of a meaty hand that knocked him off his feet. Two spectators indicated disapproval. Rataka smashed their heads together and strode on. To save a culture, Bradley, said Montgomery, who was watching the brutal display with admiration, you need strength, not delicacy or feeling. That man shall be the king of the Quaxes. He ran after Rataka. The members of the outpost staff looked at Bill in dismay. He shrugged sadly and walked out of the headquarters hut. At the doorway, Adla'a was waiting for him, with the same old plea. Play ball, he begged. More play ball, Bill Brad. In his despondent mood, Bill did not care. All right, I'll throw the ball to you. You throw it back to me. Quaxa not do that. It is just as much fun to throw the ball in one direction as it is in any other direction, Bill explained patiently. Unless you throw it back, forget it. No play ball. Adla'a thought seriously. Hunky dokey. What play ball? They were tossing it back and forth in the middle of a cheering group when a half-track passed, taking Montgomery, Handy, and Rataka to the main camp. 
The look that the girl gave Bill was disdainful. "'There's a gaggle of natives outside in assorted shades,' said Pat Reed the next day. "'They want to play ball. Moalo's at their head. He carved a bat. "'Tell him to beat it. We're busy. "'Let's give em some fun while we can. "'They won't enjoy life much after King Rat comes back here.' "'That's the truth,' Bill agreed. "'All right.' "'I wish your painted idiots would get over their baseball mania,' complained Rudy Peters, the mineralogist, two days later. "'Look me over carefully, will you, Bill? I think my throwing arm just dropped off.' "'They're nutty about it, all right,' Bill Bradley said. "'Too bad it couldn't have been about something with some economic value.' "'Economic value the man wants. Okay, I'll talk economic value to you.' Bet you fifty units I can make a better ball team out of these freaks than you can. Well, make it thirty. You're on, sucker. I've lined up the sweetest shortstop that ever spit in a glove. Here's your thirty, said Rudy Peters a week after. How was I to know the shortstop wouldn't throw the ball to anyone except the center fielder? Team plays the stuff, lad, said Bill Bradley. Stress team play. Twenty-five. Twenty-seven, twenty-nine, thirty. Exactly right. Another lesson at the same price? He was refused. But never on an exploration had Bill Bradley had so much fun. And never, he reminded himself grimly, had he got so little work done. The Quexa were neglecting their skimpy food plots in their eagerness to play. They were getting lean. Finally, with reluctance, Bill called a temporary halt to baseball. Bill Brad says no baseball till work done, said Moalo, sadly to Adlaa. Sometimes Bill Brad talked like Southpaw Pitcher. Adlaa was trying to cultivate his food plot with the help of a thrag. The beast was of an independent mind. It dragged Adlaa in eccentric ovals, in defiance of agricultural needs. Adlaa want finish work, play ball, the Quexel commented. Thrag no play baseball. Say nuts to work. Adlaa be old like old Hoss Radborn before work done. Moalo contemplated. Adlaa have trouble his thrag. Moalo have trouble his. Moalo help Adlaa his thrag, and Adlaa help Moalo his. Get work done more faster. Adlaa dismissed the revolutionary thought. Quaxes not do. We play baseball rundown play, argued Maalo. Play together. You throw ball me, I throw ball you. Yippee, man out. Same team, old pals. Want to sing team song? Want to play team with thrag? Adlaa considered the matter in this new light. Like baseball game, he said at last in amazement. Sure, you, me. Be us together. Make Thrag look like Busher. They both took hold of the Thrag. Unable to resist their combined strengths, the beast submitted docilely. They began to work. Glancing out from his labor in the headquarters Numo hut, Bill saw the incident in happy surprise. Perhaps, after all, his stay here might produce something to help the culture that Montgomery would introduce upon his return. He had no doubt of Montgomery's success. Neither, for that matter, had Montgomery. At the main camp, things were going swimmingly. The camp lay on the very fringe of Quaxa territory, but by an arduous hunt, Ritaka had captured eight wandering Quaxas, to whom he immediately set about teaching the duties of subjects. His method was simple. The Quaxas followed his orders, which he obtained from Montgomery, or the Quaxa was knocked down. If he still refused, he was knocked down again. Within three weeks, Ritaka had them doing things no Quaxas ever had done before. They performed them reluctantly and sullenly, but they did them. Seeing the result, but not the means, Candy was enthusiastic. They're working together, she cried. Oh, Monty, what will the Quaxas do to reward you? Oh, they'll probably make a culture god of me said Montgomery, managing to look modest, like the Greeks did with that Martian. 
from Satha, who taught them to use fire. As time went on, though, the girl began to have doubts. But they're doing everything for Ritaka, she protested. As far as they're concerned themselves, they're more wretched than before. That's the way feudal cultures are built, my dear, Montgomery assured her. The king gives them law and a fighting leader. In return, the subjects take care of his bodily comfort. But they look so unhappy. In saving an inferior race, we cannot be concerned too much about the happiness of a few miserable members. Perhaps in three hundred years or so, they can afford happiness. And finally an incident happened to complete her disillusionment. One of Rataka's morose subjects managed to slip the shackles with which he had been bound at night and make a bolt for freedom. The king pursued him relentlessly, brought him back, then beat him, coldly and cruelly, slugging and gouging and kicking. Ashen-faced, Candy moved to interfere. Montgomery restrained her. We're saving a race, he said. You can't make an omelet without breaking a few eggs. Candy turned and ran sobbing to her quarters, unable to dispel the memory of the writhing body on the ground. The next day was the day to move equipment. It was a policy of the expeditions to leave their worn-out machines for the most friendly of the native races, who could dismantle them and use the parts. The equipment not worth toting back to Earth was to be taken to the advance camp where the Quaxa Center was. Montgomery also planned that day to take Rataka to his kingdom. A few minutes ahead of the motorcade, Candy slipped out, got into a battered half-track, and started driving the eighty miles to the advance camp. For the first twenty-five miles, she told herself that her eagerness was because it was a nice day, and she wanted to get out of camp. For the next twenty-five miles, she called herself a liar. For the third twenty-five miles, she gave herself up unashamedly to thinking about Bill Bradley, his smile, his gentleness, the awkward grace of his lean body. Not a man to set a planet on fire, but how pleasant and restful to have around. She wondered if he would forgive the way she had acted. Somehow, she was sure he would. The narrow vehicular trail ran through a grove of fern-like trees. It's just over the rise, Candy thought, just over the rise and down into the saucer, where Bill is waiting. The half-track struck a rock, lurched, threw a tread, and went off the road out of control. That did not matter especially, for the Quaxes could use the materials very well where it was. Candy went forward briskly afoot. A fallen branch brushed her ankle. Unheedingly, she kicked it away. She began to reconstruct Bill, feature by feature, the way his hair swirled on his forehead, his eyebrows, arched and regular, his eyes, wide, deep-seated, with inner pools of merriment, his nose, straight and rather... Another branch caught her. She lifted her foot to free it. It did not come free. Another tentacle moved around her, pinioning her right arm to her side. She whirled in terror and found herself in the grip of the Horels. There were a dozen of the horrors, their antenna ears erect, mandibles open. They exuded an acid odor, a sign of hunger. Candy screamed. She fought to reach her pistol, strapped to her right hip. More tentacles stopped her. She screamed and screamed again, throwing her body to shake off the grip, trying to kick with her feet. There was movement in the road at the top of the rise. For a moment, elation surged in Candy, almost stiffening her. Perhaps some expedition member had hurt her, was trying to rescue her. Then she saw the newcomers were Quexus. Hope vanished, leaving her limp and hollow. To be killed by these horrors was bad enough, but to be killed in the presence of a group of piebald morons who would stand and watch and moan but not lift a hand. In her agitation she did not notice the Quexus were nine in number, and wore baseball caps. They drew short clubs, shaped like bats. "'Kill the umpire!' they shouted, hatred born of diamond conflicts in their cry. "'Kill the umpire!' they yelled and charged. 
In military formation, they clubbed their way through their enemies, battering and smashing until Candy was free, with a dozen dying Horels on the ground, their tentacles contracting and writhing. The Quetzal leader made his bobbling bow to her. How do, he said politely. We dip them in calcimine vat, you bet. We hang them out like wash. Now we give Team Yell. The Quetzals put their arm around one another's shoulders. In unison they chanted, Ho tomato, ho potato, half past alligator, bum bum bulligator, chickala da, pussycats, pussycats, ra ra ra. Pussycats, the leader explained to Candy, are honored animal on planet where Bill Brad is head cheese. I'll bet you play baseball nicely, Candy said. Woe broke forth on nine broad faces. Misfortunately not, confessed the captain. Thirty-three teams in Quexatown, pussycats in thirty-third place. He brightened. Go ivory hunt now. Catch nine new Quexas. Teach em baseball. Then maybe we beat em, and not be in cellar any more. Together the team bobbed politely to Candy, and trotted down the road. Happily, Candy went up the rise, then stopped in astonishment, looking at Quexatown. Gone was the straggling, haphazard settlement, with the flimsy huts and unattended starvation patches, where individual Quexas tried to raise their own food. Instead, building sites were laid out in straight, broad rows, and the Quexas were working, three and four in a group, raising substantial homes of timber. Others were surrounding the settlement with a wall of brambles, impenetrable to horals. Teams of men, two to a thrag, were plowing, preparing large fields for tillage. And down the side of the settlement, affectionately tended, ran a line of baseball fields. Just off the road, a quexa squatted, ball cap on his head, watching a crude sundial. Nice gay for a game, he greeted Candy. Speechless with surprise, the girl made a dazed, questioning gesture toward the improvements. Bill Brad do it, the Quex informed her. He tell us how. Work one by one, he says. Work all time to fill belly. Maybe fill Horel belly instead. Work all by all. Do more quickly. Have time in afternoon. Batter up. Sock it, boy. Wing it home. He's sliding. The sun's shadow touched a peg. Five minutes, bawled the Quexa. The laborers quit work, put away their tools. The farmers herded their thrags into a strongly constructed corral. The natives gathered in knots at the settlement's edge and looked longingly at the baseball fields. Yesterday I fooled Bill Brad, confided a Quexa. I hid ball, catch him off second. Bill Brad get all red-faced and say, Never mind what Bill said, Candy interjected hastily. The shadow touched another peg. Play ball, the Quexa yelled. Play ball, play ball, play ball. He sprang up, produced a baseball glove, and spat into it reverently. I go play now. You come see. Get scorecard, no players. He looked at Candy hopefully. Especially me, he added. Out of the moil of Quexus came the lank form of Bill Bradley. He spied the girl, hooped, and came running to her. For a few moments they talked at once, in an incoherent and ecstatic jumble. Then Candy, catching control of herself, cited in admiration the change in the Quexa village. "'And you've done all this?' she concluded. "'I didn't do anything,' Bill protested. "'They like to play baseball, and this sort of happened. "'We're getting representative government into action now. "'Each team elects a captain, and the captains are the town council. "'Tonight they're going to vote on naming the settlement Brooklyn.' "'You know,' said Candy, I bet they'll make you a culture god. The tanned face of Bill Bradley took on the rose hue of a blush. Well, Moalo carved a statue, and they've put it in front of the League headquarters. That's their city hall, he admitted uncomfortably. It doesn't look much like me. I've got six arms, because they wanted me batting, pitching, and catching a ball all at the same time. Candy slipped a hand into his. Is there a place around here, she asked in a small tone, where a culture god can take a girl and, well, talk to her? Is there, said Bill, 
You just come with me. A heavy object bumped into him. He whirled at the touch. Oh, hi, Ritaka, he said in a flat voice. Montgomery's king had returned to his subjects. He was alone, his captives having escaped off the ride over. He was in a vile temper. Glaring evilly, he motioned at the baseball players. He was recalling an advice of Montgomery. Whatever your subjects like to do most, do it better than they can. In that way, you'll get their respect and find it easier to take over. What that fool doings on, snarled Rataka. Rataka do too. Bill's already sagging spirits sank again. With Rataka's strength and reflexes, the great brute undoubtedly would become a star of stars, gathering admirers to himself and destroying all the pleasant prospects now so happily started. Still, it was Bill's duty to give him every chance. I see that the team has an opening, Rataka. Perhaps you'd better bat seventh for a few days. Then you can move up to clean-up spot. The giant stopped him. Rataka not ordinary quexer. Rataka a king. Rataka not play like those serfs. What special job? A wild thought struck Bill. On the playing fields were more than two hundred quaxas, most of them with a justified and carefully nurtured dislike of the surly slab of muscle before him. In the old days, they could do nothing individually against him, but the quaxas had learned to fight as a team. If he could only give them a shadow of an excuse, trap Rataxa into rousing their joint anger, take advantage of the prejudices of their newfound love of baseball, then Rataka would get the reckoning that he deserved. The days of his supremacy would be over. The threat of his tyranny would be removed from the happy race. Bill grinned broadly. Sure thing, old pal, he said. He took off his own baseball cap and put it backward on Rataka's head. He signaled for someone to bring over a mask and chest protector. There's only one of these in each playing field, Bill explained. In a way, he's boss of the game. Are you sure you want to do it? Sometimes the players argue with you. Anybody argue with Rataka, the giant said, raising a huge fist. Rataka knock him down. Rataka a king. Boss of game. Okay, boy, you ask for it, Bill said. He thrust a whisk broom into Rataka's hand. You can be umpire, said Bill Bradley. The End of Half-Past Alligator by Donald Coven